hasten to another study of a key word which unlocks scripture. Our key word today is image or likeness. The Imago Dei, or image of God, is a subject of great importance to the serious Bible student. A wrong concept of its meaning in Scripture will corrupt either one's theology or anthropology or both. Too high a view of man as created in the image of God leads to blasphemy. Too low a view of man the creature, the heir of Adam's likeness, leads to the false evaluation that he's no more than an animal. Now the key passage on the subject of the Imago Dei in Scripture reads, And Elohim said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now the question we shall seek to face is, what constitutes the image or likeness of God in Adam, and does that same image or likeness exist in all men at present, or was it either marred or obliterated by Adam's fall? Now the Hebrew word translated man in the above passage is Adam, a term rendered Adam in Genesis 2.19. Man and Adam are the same word in Hebrew. Adam is also used as a generic name for the entire human race, and at times may be understood as simply mankind. Although the origin of the Hebrew word for man or Adam is somewhat obscure, there seems to be a general consensus of opinion that it is related to, if not actually derived from, the Hebrew word adhama, meaning redness, uh, a color of earth or ground. And we are told that the Lord God formed man, Adham, out of the dust of the ground, Adhama. Now these two Hebrew words, translated man and ground in this verse, relate to the same word as Edom, or Edom as we call it, which also means that which is red. Edom is another name for Esau, who came out red from his mother's womb, as well as for his descendants, the Edomites, and their tribal territory of Edomia. Scripture makes a great deal of the color red in connection with Esau, such as the red pottage for which he sold his birthright, and gained the name Edom. Now the creation narrative informs us that when the Lord God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, man became a living soul. Unlike the animal kingdom, man also is a spirit being. And it is by means of his spirit that man knows, worships, and serves the God with which his spirit identifies and to whom he is bound. There is a spirit in man, says Job, and the breath, Ishmath, of the Almighty, gives them understanding. Now the creation narrative also bears the testimony that the Lord God, in the day of creation, breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life. Not only was Adam given life in the flesh, but he was given spiritual life, that is, life in the spirit as well. It was this gift of a living human spirit which exalted him over the animal kingdom, over which the Creator gave dominion or rule. No animal has a spirit whereby it can know, worship, and serve its Creator. No animal will ever find itself in the courts of heaven. The animal kingdom possesses only physical life, but man has a spirit life which enables him to know, worship, and serve the one to whom he is bound by a like spirit. Before his fall, Adam was a living spirit capable of knowing, worshiping, and serving the God of the living. The question is, was he still capable of these things after his disobedience when he partook of the fruit of the tree of death? You know, the Lord God warned Adam that he would die if he partook of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, saying, In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And the word of God is quite clear in his testimony that Adam did not die physically when he ate the forbidden fruit. Shall we assume, like some reprobate scholars, that God did not keep his word to Adam? Of course not. God cannot lie, therefore the answer is to be sought for elsewhere. Now, we don't have far to search. 
if we remember that the Lord God breathed the breath of life into Adam's nostrils. In the instant that Adam sinned, his human spirit, his spirit died, not his body, his spirit died. Where he had been created a living spirit, he now became a dead spirit. He was now in the flesh, spiritually dead in trespasses and sins. As a dead human spirit was incapable of communicating with the God of the living, Adam now bore the likeness, image of the God of the dead, that old serpent the devil who had betrayed him. Where he had once known the God of the living ones, now he could know the God of the dead ones. This condition of spiritual death was passed on to all of his descendants. For as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. The death of Adam's spirit, his human spirit, even though he continues for hundreds of years, is reflected in a profound statement concerning the image or likeness which Adam's descendants received from the federal head of the human race. We are told, Adam lived a hundred thirty years and begot a son in his own likeness, after Adam's image. No longer can it be said that man bears God's likeness and God's image. For after eating of the forbidden fruit and the execution of the death penalty on his spirit, Adam's race is found to be in dying bodies with dead human spirits. In Adam, all die. Only those whom the triune God has chosen to place in Christ Jesus and are made alive in Him by regeneration of their human spirits, live. Paul makes it very clear that all men are born into this world with dead human spirits, part of the image of Adam which all human beings inherit. He tells the saints at Ephesus of their preconditioned being. He said, You were dead in trespasses and sins, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, made us alive with Christ. Oh, by grace are ye saved. Now these saints to whom Paul is writing were not physically dead. Like the animal kingdom, they had the breath of physical life in them. They were dead in trespasses and sins in time past, which is to say their human spirits were dead. And as dead human spirits bound to the God of dead spirits, both angelic and human, these were governed by the God of the dead in days past. And this is why the apostle states in the same passage, Ye were dead in trespasses and sins, in which in times past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the leading of the prince of the power of the air, that is, the spirit who works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all had our manner of life in time past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Satan, the prince of the demonic powers, is seen here in this verse to be the evil force controlling the walk, that is, the way of life of those who are spiritually dead. He is their governor. He is their ruler. And until the Ephesians were regenerated by the will and power of God, they walked in darkness as sons of disobedience and as children of wrath. Their human spirits were dead. Therefore they mirrored or reflected or imaged the God of dead spirits, Satan. Now the basic law of an image is obedience. If it does not conform to the original whether in the realm of the physical or of the spiritual, it is not a genuine likeness. For example, if you stand before your mirror and comb your hair, your image will comb its hair. If your hair is red and your eyes blue, the likeness in the mirror will have red hair and blue eyes. In fact, it will conform perfectly in every detail to the original you present to be reflected back to you. The basic law of an image is obedience. The spirit in man declares whom he serves as Lord. That's why Paul says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? You see, Adam was created with a living human spirit capable of mirroring the imago Dei, the likeness or image of God. 
As long as he was obedient to his Creator, the likeness of the Lord God was to be seen in the mirror of his living human spirit. But when man turned from obeying God, refusing to acknowledge himself to be the Lord's servant or bond slave by his subjection, his human spirit died. From that moment on, as a dead spirit being, Adam and his descendants, who have inherited his dead human spirit, reflect the likeness of Satan, who is the god of dead spirits. Like it or not, man was created to be a slave to a higher power. The quality of his life declares the condition of his spirit. So speaking to the slaves at Rome, Paul says, When ye were the bond slaves of sin, ye were free from righteousness. But now, being made free from sin and become bond slaves to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness, and the end, everlasting life. Each person born into the world is born with a dead human spirit. If by the grace of God he is born again, his human spirit is made alive. Those with dead human spirits reflect the image of Satan as they walk in the flesh, under the direction of their carnal minds, at enmity against God. They are bound slaves of the evil one. Yet those with living human spirits reflect the likeness of the God of the living as they walk in the Spirit, under the control of the mind of Christ in full obedience. They are slaves of God and delight in the title, as did the Apostle Paul. For now, as his slaves, they are capable of reflecting his likeness and his image. We do know that at the second coming of Christ, the righteous shall shine forth as the sun, the S-U-N, in the kingdom of their Father. In glorified bodies, fully governed by the mind of Christ, constantly filled with the Holy Spirit enthroned within us, we shall be in His image, for we shall be in complete subjection, body, soul, and spirit, to God. The likeness of the triune God will be found in us as it was in Adam, for living spirits in perfect subjection to the God of the living must express His image. The first man is of the earth earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earth, such are they also who are earthy. And as is heavenly, such are they also who are heavenly ones. Just as we have borne the image of the earthy one, that is, Adam, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly one, Jesus Christ. Paul assures the church at Colossae that Jesus is the image of the invisible God while assuring the saints that their new man, that is, their regenerated man, Christ in them, is being renewed in knowledge after the image of him who created him. That is, our new man is being renewed in the likeness of our Creator. And he assures the saints at Corinth that the dark veil of the law of Moses has been removed, so that the elect might with unveiled face behold, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, to be changed into the same image as the Lord, from glory to glory, as by the Spirit of the Lord. So the image to which reference is made in Scripture when it says that man was made in the image of God is in terms of the likeness of his Spirit, the way that God is, that's the way that we are supposed to be. God is righteous. His children, therefore, are called to righteousness. God is holy. His children are called to be holy. God is separated from all others. His children are called to be separated from all others. We are to be as He is. And since when we receive our resurrection bodies, we will be without sin, we'll have sinless bodies, the mind of Christ will govern us completely, the Holy Spirit will be filling us totally and fully at all times, then it will be possible for the perfect image of God to be seen in us, wholly and completely restored. Now the God of this age has blinded unbelievers, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The glorious purpose of God in the redemption which he affords his people, his elect ones, his saints, in Christ Jesus, is the restoration of the original image in them which Adam lost when he sinned. John writes, Beloved, now we are the children of God. 
It does not appear what we shall be, but we know this, that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. That is, we shall be in his likeness or image, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as Christ is pure. And it's been that marvelous passage in Romans 8, 28 and following. He says, For whom God did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. If you are one of those whom God foreknew because he had placed you in his divine plan to be saved, if he had declared that you were to be among those to be saved, you have the assurance that you will be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Shall not we therefore join David, who, as he viewed the blessed hope of our glorification, sang, I shall be satisfied when I awake, dear Lord, in thy likeness. Amen. You've been listening to our Sunday program of worship teaching. It began with a half-hour hymn sing, and then we had a pre-recorded broadcast featuring study on the word image, image by the late Dr. Dwayne Spencer of San Antonio, Texas.